Welcome to another edition of the FRA Launch Series. We're here today with Huck and Nancy Muldowney, who in addition to being FRA parents, are also deeply involved in the medical field where they've worked for the last 25 years. So I want to say thank you to the two of you for making time in your busy schedules to join us today. And as we get started with this conversation, would love it if you could share a little bit more about the roles you all find yourselves in right now and, and over the last couple of years, what your jobs have looked like within medicine. All right, Nancy, go first. So um, I'm Nancy Muldowney, and I am a clinical nurse manager of operations at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Um, I do work in our provider network contracting and value-based contracting department. Um, and I, I know everybody's like, you work for a payer and you're a nurse. Um, there, are, there are actually over 800 nurses at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Uh, I am nurse leader. Um, I have um, a group of 20 nurses that report in through me that are embedded in primary care practices throughout Tennessee uh, and the middle Tennessee region. Uh, we have several managers across the state. And those, those uh, nurses that uh, report up through me, they work with very complex um, patients. Um, and in light of everything that's going on now, they're working with very complex patients that um, are at risk for COVID-19 um, and also trying to connect them back with their primary care provider if they are having very chronic issues. Um, so that's my current role at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And uh, what I do is I work at two different hospitals. I work at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and I also work at the Nashville VA Hospital. Uh, I'm a cardiologist by training. Um, the main thing that I do is I take care of patients with autonomic diseases. Uh, there are about three or four different diseases of the autonomic nervous system, which regulates heart rate and blood pressure. So people whose heart rates shoot up when they stand up or their heart blood pressures drop when they stand up, diseases called POTS, multi-system atrophy. They're very rare diseases. And I see patients from all across the country who come to Vanderbilt for care for the diseases that I treat. Uh, and then at the VA, I also take care of autonomic diseases and also do general cardiology and echocardiography uh, as part of my job there. All right, fantastic. So obviously each of you has moved into a position where you've advanced within your fields. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in medicine in those early years? Sure. Well, that's where we met. So uh, I think that's a good place to start. But Huck and I met at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I was a floor nurse um, on the oncology unit um, at UPenn, um, or also known as HUP. And um, Huck was doing his residency there. And um, so that's kind of where I began my nursing career at Penn. Um, I did everything in oncology um, at Penn and um, kind of advanced to um, hematologic stem cell transplant. I did outpatient infusion for oncology patients, which is actually um, only the, the very, um, I would say, very skilled and um, elite nurses are uh, advanced into the infusion center just because you're looking at, you're doing infusions for every um, oncology patient. So from there, uh, we got married in 2001 and we moved to Nashville for Hux Fellowship in Cardiology here at Vanderbilt. And again, I started at Vanderbilt in the um, cancer clinic. Um, and I was at Vanderbilt for 15 years prior to going to Blue Cross Blue Shields where I did a lot of different roles in nursing, but that's really where I began my love for leadership and nursing leadership. So I've um, been doing that um, for about, I would say 12 years now, and been out of the direct patient care role for about 12 years. It's all you now. Awesome, all right. <laughs> so um, after college, uh, I went to medical school at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, um, did my residency in internal medicine uh, at the University of Pennsylvania where I met Nancy. I uh, dragged her here to Nashville for my cardiology fellowship, and she hasn't forgiven me since, um, but I kid. Uh, but um, my career in cardiology has been a little bit more circuitous than um, my journey to cardiology. So ever since I was a small child, I was interested in medicine, and I wanted to be a physician, and I wanted to be a heart doctor. Um, and then wind the clock forward from my childhood to college, medical school, everything was with the plan to become a cardiologist. And um, once I got to medical school, there were areas that interested me, um, primarily uh, biomedical research. And, and um, I really enjoyed doing biomedical research. And when I did my residency and fellowship, 
it was within a program that was specifically for future physician scientists. And, um, you know, so I spent three years doing research, one year of doing research in medical school, three years doing research during my fellowship training and, and residency training. Um, and then when I completed all of that training, um, the landscape in, in science began to change a little bit. Uh, my mentor had left. Um, and then by the time that I got in grant funding, um, the company that made one of the drugs I needed to use for my research and um, other various bureaucratic barriers started creeping into biomedical science. And I moved more to the clinical side at that point, which at the beginning I didn't expect to do, but then I did. And as I made that transition, um, one of my mentors from medical school approached me and said that you know they had an opening within their group, which is the autonomic disease group. And since I had worked with them in medical school and had done some research with them in medical school, um, the opening in the group, uh, my skills as a physician would be complementary to what they're already doing in science. And so I was able to continue to be academic and continue to help in progressing, you know, the medical field um, and do what I really love to do. And I found that my, my skill set is, which is taking care of patients. Uh, so it was a nice balance. But if you ask me today, if I was going to be doing what I'm doing when I was in medical school, even when I was doing projects with this group in medical school, I would have said, that's not probably what I'm going to be doing. So um, it's kind of funny how in a certain sense, I'm doing what I expected to do. But then when you get really into the details, I'm completely doing something opposite of what I thought I would be doing within the field that I thought I would do. I love that. <laughs> that so your childhood self would feel like this is exactly what you should have ended up doing. Um, but the path in between looks a little bit different. And yes. also, it's, it's really interesting knowing uh, a lot of different families with physicians, the fact that both of you were able to continue to move through your medical careers. I know that placement oftentimes pulls in, in very different directions. And the fact that for each of you, there was an opportunity in Nashville is, is really fantastic. And that, I guess that's, that's what I want to hear a little bit more. And, and Huck, you've already talked about this a little bit. If y'all are thinking back, what were kind of, were there key breaks or opportunities that you felt like really set you on the path that you ultimately were able to, to pursue successfully? I would say, um, you know, I had some really great mentors along the way. And I think that in nursing, that is a very, very big part of our role um, is making sure that we are preparing um, our um, employees and our staff for the future because they are the ones that are going to be taking care of patients in the future. And we all know that um, our population is aging. Um, there are a lot of elderly people now that, and that's not going to stop over the next 10 years. So I think that for me, um, I want to make sure that whoever I am mentoring, that they have all the skills that they need. So I would say that my mentors along the way really helped guide me in terms of they identified very early in my nursing career that nursing leadership was a strength of mine. Um, I was very operational. I was very, um, you know, um, if I was given, you know, 15 patients, I was very quickly able to figure out, okay, this is my priority. And these are the things that I can get to later. And people don't realize that nursing is a very versatile role. Um, and it really, um, there's a ton of skills that you need in order to be very successful in nursing. Um, that's not in just direct patient care. It's also, you know, doing remote nursing, which is what I'm doing now. My team is all remote and that is not something that's taught in nursing school. You know, you're not taught to assess a patient over the phone in nursing school. So how do we teach that to our nurses? So I feel that um, kind of my breaking point was you know, kind of seeing different leadership throughout my career and seeing what I really loved about certain leaders and what I didn't. Um, and if I, if I was going to be a nurse leader, which I am today, taking those things that really stood out to me in a nursing leader um, and make sure that I was, um, that I, you know, I was exhuming that and I was, I was pushing that down to my staff. Um, you know, I lead by empowerment. And so I think that that's always been very successful for me um, throughout my career. Sorry. And um, I'll pick that, I'll pick up, I'll pick that up. Um, Sorry. So um, I think also one thing that's been helpful for us is that since, you know, we, you know, really had a teamwork approach to both of our careers, 
that we're in an environment where there are a lot of opportunities in the medical medical sphere. I mean, Nashville is one of the national hubs, national centers as far as medical excellence. I mean, you have Boston, you have Philadelphia, you have Houston, you have us, you have probably some places I'm not thinking of. But I mean, there's not a lot of places per capita where you have a large amount of medical industry and very, very strong medical centers. We have Vanderbilt, we have St. Thomas, we have HCA. We have a lot of fantastic places. And then all of the, just the, the, the medical partners, mm-hmm. all the companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield and Cigna and all of the medical partners in town, all the small companies I'm not thinking of, but um, like, what's, what's the one that, what's your name? Sarah? Which one? Uh, the one that um, your friend is up. The accent, is it? Anyway, um, so but there's just a lot of different um, a lot of different medical centers um, and medical businesses in town. So um, it's a great place to have, have a career because a lot of opportunities are available if you're looking for them. Um, and then I'm in direct patient care, but um, you know we have a lot of really great hospitals in this town and a lot of really great doctors. And so it's not an it's not a hard place to be a doctor uh, as it would be to be in a medical desert. And I think just, you know, sorry about my, my phone going off, but um, I think Huck also has had some very, very good mentors along the way as well. Um, I think that um, just seeing, you know, his leaders throughout his cardiology um, and also, you know, I think in the medical field, we really do rely on our mentors to, to help us through that journey. And I mean, I'm still close with, you know, my first manager that I had at um, a University of Pennsylvania. And it just shows you that, you know, it is something that it just goes with you throughout your entire career. And, you know, I think that's why nursing leadership is just a very, um, for me, um, it's really not a job. It's a, it's a love and it's a passion. And, you know, I think it's just, um, I'm, I'm just very content. So I think, I hope that that answered that question. I I think it did. Absolutely. And, and it's, what I love about this series is, is, and you're doing it virtually, but we're, we're putting you all, I hope in a position where you're, you're playing that role for a lot of our students who are watching, who are interested um, as, as far as beginning to be people who provide some of that mentorship and wisdom. So I guess this, I'll ask you this last question and then I wanna talk more about where you see the, the next couple months going because I know a lot of people who are watching this are, are interested to hear your feedback there. But if you were speaking with a group of students who were interested in going into nursing leadership or going into um, practicing medicine, or honestly, even in, in research, since that was a part of your story too. What, what advice would you give students who are considering that path or who have already started down that path? I would say that you really have to be very um, compassionate. I mean, there are certain aspects of this type of field that, I mean, if you are find yourself getting very frustrated with um, people, you know, because they're not able to you know, move as quickly. I mean, you have to be very, very patient um, and compassionate. And I think that you have to really have a love and desire. Um, This is a calling. It's just like being a priest and it's just like being, you know, I would think a teacher or, you know, somebody, I mean, we both at a very early age knew that we wanted to go into fields where we helped people for the rest of their lives. And I, I, we always joke about this, but I don't think we're ever going to retire. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. We, we both, um, you know, I mean, recently, I mean, I've signed up to be on the COVID team at Vanderbilt, you know, to help out in any way that I can, um, aside from what I'm doing at Blue Cross Blue Shield, because I feel that, um, that need to really, and that desire to help people. So I think that, that um, my advice would just be, um, you know, it is a very, um, they're very, very difficult careers in terms of their, your path is kind of laid out for you. So, you know, meaning that you sign up for nursing or, or medicine, you know, your you, the electives are a little bit different just because you're kind of, it's, it's planned out for you. Um, and you have to love science, you have to love math, but the biggest thing you have to love people and you have to really want to help people. And I think that that's my biggest advice I could give to people. Yeah. I mean, that, that pretty much sums it up. I mean, um, it is a calling. And I think that um, my, my, my uncle, who was an orthopedic surgeon, gave me advice when I was a kid. And he said to me, and this was you know in the 70s and 80s, um, he said, don't go into medicine if there's anything else you want to do with your life or anything else you want to do as a career. And honestly, 
I couldn't see myself doing anything else then. And every step along the way, when I was having to make a decision, do I want to go into medicine? And, you know, still, I don't know what else I would do other than, you know, taking care of patients. And, um, you know, you have to be compassionate, you have to be patient, you have to care, and you have to listen. The patients give you all the answers. I mean, and you have to listen to them because they'll tell you what's wrong with them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, anything that I've ever, any misstep I've ever had in medicine has been from caring too much, where I get my hand slapped by some administrator because anything that I did didn't follow some protocol or some procedure because I was putting caring first and that second. So um, I come from the Hawkeye Pierce School of Medicine in that regard. Um, but yeah, no, so I think that's kind of everything that Nancy said was 100% right. Wow, that's fantastic. So every industry, we've, we've done a lot of these different interviews. Every industry has been affected by COVID-19. And you all are, are sitting sort of in the, one of the central places that people are considering, you know, how, how are we dealing with the, the medical challenge surrounding this? Can you share with us a little bit about what the last few months have looked like in your worlds and how it's been, how, how, what, what has changed and what's been, what maybe hasn't changed Walk, walk us through maybe what you expected and, and how has it really gone? And then I've got a couple more follow-up questions because this is, it's a really interesting question, I think, for a lot of us. Yeah, I'll go first on this one. Um, so we came back from spring break a day early because everything was kind of winding down, shutting down. Things were getting a little bit intense. And when we got back to Nashville, um, you know, we were, Vanderbilt was already in, and, and the VA was already getting, gearing up to, you know, reduce our outpatient capacity, reduce our elective capacity um, to make room for the overwhelming, massive apocalypse of patients coming, you know, potentially from the COVID uh, epidemic. And um, we were very fortunate in Nashville that, you know, everything that had happened up until that point led to um, us not getting overwhelmed. I mean, we were ready to take operating rooms and convert them to ICU beds. Uh, we converted a section of um, one of the floors into an additional ICU. Um, we added um, a lot, two floors of bed capacity that we were going to open, but it just wasn't ready yet. And we got it ready very quickly at Vanderbilt. And we made similar plans over at the VA hospital to figure out what we needed to do to maximize capacity. We were prepared to take overflow from the city um, of non-veterans uh, and take care of non-veterans at the VA hospital. So we had this tremendous plan in place and then we waited and we waited and we were seeing patients and you know fortunately everything that's everything that's unfolded the way it's unfolded um our capacity has not been stretched and you know everyone at Vanderbilt and everyone at um you know the VA has done really a fantastic job overall um the people that have they've been advising us um they've been keeping us up to date keeping us informed very well um, and so we were able to be ready and because I'm a cardiologist, I was like going to be like a second, third, fourth reserve for ICUs. And we've never had to do that. Um, we haven't had to tap into that depth chart for physicians and nurses. I mean, what happened in New York City, nowhere even came close to happening in Nashville. And we're very fortunate. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, national, statewide, citywide and then you know Vanderbilt and VA leadership and the other the other hospitals as well I'm sure everybody did a fantastic job and everybody who's been patient and kind of stayed in place and didn't go out and didn't go you know you know followed advisement I think everybody did a great job I mean it's it's been basically a, t a national team effort and I think a lot of people have done by and large the right things mm -hmm. and uh, and we've enjoyed you know very tremendous success as a consequence yeah, so on my side, um, again, we came back, we were out of uh, the country, we were in the Cayman Islands, and we came back and um, very, very quickly, Blue Cross, uh, we had to put processes in place because our customers not only are our members, but they're also the providers that we contract with. And we had to put processes in place for doctors to see their patients um, telephonically um, and also via telehealth in a very, very quick fashion. Um, it was happening a little bit, but not as much, um, meaning we had to turn on a light switch and we had to figure it out. And we had to make it where it was seamless for the doctors to be able to see the patients and 
figure out a way that, um, that we could reimburse the doctors for seeing the patients and getting those patients in that really need to be seen. So I think from my perspective, 97% um, of Blue Cross is now remote. Um, and I think that what we're going to see is that a lot of people are going to stay remote um, to decrease the likelihood that we're going to all be on top of each other again in our regional offices. Um, you know, I don't think leadership will stay remote, but I think there will be more remote access to, um, to our employees. Uh, my, luckily, my team was already remote anyway because they're embedded in practices. So that was not a new um, process for me. Uh, but now everybody's home. And so you have to make sure productivity is and, and all of those things that you're meeting your goals that you set for your team uh, in a different manner. And so I think um, Blue Cross is, again, I think the keys here are communication and also as a leader, making sure that you are um, remaining calm through the process. Uh, it, you know, it, it, watching the news will drive everybody crazy. And I, I think that they're trying to get as much information out to the public as possible. But I think that there's a, a different approach that could have happened for that because it's really, I think the pandemic became such a pandemic because it, it really just, you know, people just kind of freaked out. Um, but at the same time, in certain areas like New York, where a lot of our friends and families are, and they are in the they're in the the, the front lines of it. Um, so, you know, what what they're seeing is very different than what we're seeing, and so we just have to keep in mind that we're very thankful that Nashville did not become a New York, but at the same time, New York did happen, and it could happen again. So we just have to really make sure that we're putting precautions in place. Um, I can't stress this enough to the teens you have to be really careful. You know, I know you guys want to, they want to see each other. They want to embrace each other. It's graduation time. It's prom time, everything. I have a teenager. I have two teenagers. Um, but I think that we have to be really careful because um, if you look at the numbers in Tennessee, the number one group of people that are getting this disease are the teenagers and young adults. It's not the older people and it's not, it's not really our age either. It's more the younger people. Um, and people are dying from this disease. So I think that we just have to take it very seriously and just make sure that, um, that we're communicating that information to our staff. But um, Blue Cross did a great job in terms of very quickly updating us as to what the new norm was going to be. Uh, we get weekly updates. We have Zoom calls with our teams every single week. So, um, so I think that, you know, again, um, I think that just like with Huck, I think we've, um, we've just kind of figured it out and we, you know, we're very thankful that also with FRA, I mean, I think that both of the schools that our kids are at, they, they you guys have communicated very well with us as well. Um, and you put the, the safety of the students and the staff first. And I think that that's, that, that was key, so. Yeah, and telemedicine um, has been quite a boom. Um, the, uh, there, the codes for telemedicine were put out on January 1st. There was a like brand new billing codes. And um, I have patients I take care of from all, literally all across the country, from at least 40 states. And I was very excited when I saw that, that maybe we could begin implementing this at some point one day. Because you know how things have that kind of inertia where you got to push it and push it. Push. And then the COVID outbreak um, flipped the light switch on. And uh, we're eight, we're, we started doing telemedicine to get to our patients who can't come and see us at Vanderbilt because of the outbreak, because we don't want people gathering in clinics and things like that. But there's a little rule that no one knows. And the little rule that no one knows <clears throat> is that you can only see patients if they are in a state you're licensed to practice in. So Vanderbilt got emergency licensure for our entire faculty in Mississippi, Alabama, and Kentucky, where most of our out-of-state patients are from. Now, I'm a little different. I have patients from 40 states. I added Georgia because I have a lot of patients from Georgia. Um, but that is something that hopefully will change in the long run because patients are liking telemedicine. Patients are really liking if they don't feel well, they can get an appointment with a doctor, see the doctor from their laptop at home. Um, and if you have to travel, I've had some people who live pretty far away do telemedicine visits with me that are, you know, in Kentucky or Mississippi. And for them, not having to drive up has been a really great thing. But like I said, I can't be licensed in 40 states. Um, it's just too much. So the, the, the government uh, is going to need to rethink its telemedicine rules. Mm -hmm. But I think but I think it's been a boon and it's been a great thing overall. Um, and, it, and it's one of the big game changers that's happened as a consequence of COVID. Just like HIV drove disposable. 
like people were using reusing needles, people were um, using glass um, bottles for IV fluid and blood, and they were reusing items. And HIV led to the disposable culture um, in medicine, disposable gloves, disposable gowns, disposable everything, um, and not, you know, re-sterilizing IV needles and things like that, um, glass syringes. Um, it, it completely transformed from materially how medical medicine works. And I think we're going to have a technology shift Absolutely. in how medicine works, um, you know, I as a consequence that. of all this. So as I'm listening to y'all, I think one of the questions that a lot of people have asked with different industries is when will things go back to normal? But it sounds like you're saying we may have a bit of a new normal, that while there will be some regression, that there will be there will be an increase in telemedicine and an increase in people working remotely. Are, are there other changes that you all see coming out of this era of, of COVID-19 whenever that happens? Are there lasting changes in your industry? Yeah, I mean, I think about um, schools, right? I mean, our students, we have, you know, anywhere from, you know, depending on what school you're at, 20 to 40 kids in a class, um, and they're not six feet apart from each other. So I think that what we are going to see is there are gonna be different guidelines that come out to avoid exposure and to decrease the likelihood of exposure for these types of um, airborne illnesses, which what they are, and really just making sure that hand washing is essential. You know, that every child should have hand sanitizer on their desk. You know, I think there's gonna be, you know, restaurants, going out to restaurants, you're not gonna be, you know, probably not going in groups of 20, you know, again, um, you're probably gonna be six feet apart. There's gonna be less tables in a restaurant but I do think we will slowly get back to where we are able to function as a society. It's just going to be a different normal. Um, and it really is, um, you know, our, our take is we want to be as positive as possible because there's so much negativity right now around it. Um, but I do think that, um, listen, if you look at our numbers in Tennessee, we did something right. Um, I think everybody listens. They really um, took the, the home orders to, you know, to a different level. And with that, that's why our numbers are not what they expected them to be. And I think that's also all over the United States. I think the government really took this very seriously and they needed to. Um, but um, I think that there's gonna be a new normal. I don't think we're ever gonna go back to where we were before, um, especially in medicine. Um, I certainly think telehealth is gonna continue. I think remote work is gonna continue. I think Zoom calls, um, hopefully you bought stock in Zoom because these types of things are you know, I'm just saying, like, I mean, that's where it's at. I mean, that's how people are going to really communicate. I mean, families, that's how we're communicating now with our families is Zoom calls weekly um, or FaceTime, you know, so those are the types of things that I think um, we're going to be seeing some big changes. Yeah, and what I hope it doesn't happen is I hope that the sense of community doesn't break down as a consequence of all these silos. I mean, I think as the treatments for COVID emerge, I mean, the Gilead compound looks like it's working out. Um, despite what you're seeing on the news, there are still hydroxychloroquine trials ongoing. <clears throat> hydroxychloroquine may be helpful, might not be helpful. It's just a matter of, you know, is the right trial answering the right question. Um, you know, mixing it with, you know, Zithromax is probably not a good idea because, you know, of arrhythmias. Um, but even those are rare and much more hyped than the reality of it. But, um, you know, we just haven't found the right population group or endpoint for hydroxychloroquine, but there are still trials ongoing that haven't failed yet. So, um, you know, so, so that might still be a treatment. The new Gilead compounds looking promising. I mean, I haven't seen much on the vaccine research, but it, the really industry is doing a Manhattan project on the vaccines. I mean, it's not these corporations are all siloed from each other. They're sharing information. You know, they're trying to get it out there. And, it just takes time. And it takes I mean, time. And the other thing is, I've been amazed at how fast things have moved. I mean, there's been a movement. This is like the first, you know, pandemic or crisis where deregulation was part of the answer. And I've seen, you know, the FDA move. At, and I work on the IRB at Vanderbilt, which is something I didn't, you know, mention before, which is I'm involved with oversight for clinical trials and things like that from like the university committee. Uh, and so I haven't seen things move as fast as all of the improvements in testing. Um, you know, switching what kind of swab you use requires a clinical trial <clears throat> for the COVID testing. Well, and where you swab from requires a clinical trial. And that's, everything's moved so fast, even though people don't feel like it has 
compared to how fast things move normally. It takes years and years to bring a drug to market. <clears throat> and if this compound works out, it's going to be on the market, you know, probably in three months, as soon as, you know, from when they get, oh yeah, it works. And they'll be getting it out there, you know, very quickly. Uh, yeah. So I've never seen, you know, testing and development and everything move as fast as it's really moved. And that's, that's been a big aspect of this. It's been really a unique component to, right. con component to um, the COVID outbreak is just, you know, some elements of de deregulating in addition to your other areas where the government's been, you know, acting. There have been points where they've not acted. And by not acted, they've helped just as much as in situations where they have acted and helped. Um, and I think that's pretty, um, pretty unique and telling. But I think that, you know, hopefully like, you know, people as a community doesn't break down. I mean, because people aren't able to go to church because people aren't going to be probably going to pools in the summer. I'm hopeful that it's going to be like the polio outbreaks of the 1950s where people were scared to death of the iron lungs. And then, you know, after the vaccine and after other things happen, people are like, oh yeah, remember when we were really scared about that? That's why we take this medicine or this is why we get this vaccine. Um, you know, and those sorts of things is, you know, because of that reminder of this is, was a scary time. But, you know, from the 1950s till now, there have been not really too many scary times from a medical standpoint, right. other than briefly, you know, the HIV outbreak, but that was a different kind of scary uh, when it came out, um, because it wasn't a situation like this where you're walking down the street, you can get it. Mm -hmm. So. Well, this, uh, this is really fascinating. I appreciate you all giving us an inside view into what's going on within medicine. And also, even just from a, a personal standpoint, I think part of why we at FRA were able to transition into online learning and, and be ready was the advice of so many doctors and nurses in our community giving us feedback on the front end. And it's, it's, it's really interesting to sort of compare um, Nashville and New York and some of those areas and, and see where um, social distancing was able to, to really sort of flatten the curve. So thank you all so much for making time today. This is a really busy time for all of us and I know exceptionally busy for both of you. So I uh, really, really appreciate it. And uh, I know that everyone who has watched this, uh, I would be shocked if they didn't end it with just a new appreciation for, for all the different things that are going on and all the different moving pieces. So whether it's our students who want to go into medicine and uh, are considering leadership and research within that, or just parents who are trying to understand exactly what's going on in the midst of this very strange time, thank you guys so much for shedding some light on it for us. No, for sure. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thanks, Prentice. Thank you, Prentice. Stay safe, okay? We will. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.